Hi, and welcome to An Intro to Socialism, a U.S. Tradition. This presentation was developed by the Portland Chapter of Democratic Socialists of America. Before we get started, let's take a look at what we will cover and what we hope people will take away, including definitions of both capitalism and socialism, some historical background on the development of capitalism and the socialist movement in the United States, and some context around the movement and the fight for socialism as it exists today. Socialism and socialist movements have a long, rich history that spans many nations, cultures, and generations. While we will cover many things in this presentation, it will not be an exhaustive or all-encompassing explanation of all things socialist. We are only scratching the surface, and we hope you will continue to research and learn more about the socialist theories, ideas, and history that we discuss. And, as it says in the title, we will primarily focus on the movement for socialism within the United States. So, what is socialism? It's not surprising that many people struggle to answer this question. Most of the definitions floating around in the mainstream about socialism range from misinformed to flat-out wrong. Opponents of socialism will often point to flawed or failed attempts to build socialism as concrete examples of why it is unachievable. These are insincere arguments based on cherry-picked facts, and they almost always ignore the historical and material context around factors such as the military and economic opposition from outside capitalist forces like the United States on any society trying to move away from capitalism and towards socialism. We will touch a little bit more on why this is the case during the history part of this presentation. The first thing we should acknowledge, though, is that the broad ideas of socialism, ideas that promote a collective and egalitarian society, have been with humanity in different forms since its earliest beginnings. They are not a contemporary concept. The modern incarnation of what we call socialism today is really just the evolution of long-standing ideas and concepts. While there are many different tendencies under the broad tent that is socialism, such as the different types of Marxism, anarchism, and many more, there is a common understanding among all of them that socialism is a system that believes in and requires inherent human equality and dignity, popular control of the economy to meet human needs, and radical democracy, where power is justly distributed by everyone having an equal voice in decisions that affect them. Obviously, we're going to talk more about socialism, but first we need to discuss where it came from. What conditions drove the development of socialist ideas, and why, if these ideas are so great, aren't they the way society is set up now? We need to talk about what we currently have, capitalism. A basic definition of capitalism is that it's an economic system based on private ownership, where individuals are permitted to privately own more property and wealth than they personally need or can use. This is known as the right to private property. Private property is not the same as personal property, such as your house or your car or your Beanie Baby collection. Socialism, despite what opponents or the misinformed might say, is not in any way opposed to people owning or having personal property. Private investment, where owners of private property decide how most of society's economic resources and wealth are used based on their own self-interest rather than public need. It's also based on profit, Capitalism is driven by the acquisition of profit through systems of exploitation, such as waged labor. An unearned rent, which just means that the profit from charging rent is never earned because the owner typically doesn't actually do anything in exchange for that profit. These are the things that allow capitalism to subsist and allow those with the money and power to thrive at the expense of the working class. If there is a single core concept at the heart of socialism, it would be power. I bet you probably weren't expecting to hear that. But understanding why socialism is opposed to capitalism is about understanding the relationship between power and class, and how political power is connected with economic power. Economics is how a society produces and distributes the things it wants and needs. That means there is a lot of power in being able to determine how economic decisions are made and how wealth and resources are distributed. The economic power dynamics of a capitalist society is that the ruling class, the capitalist class, profits from the wealth produced by the physical, mental, and emotional labor of the less powerful class, 
the working class, which does all the work. Again, this is because the capitalists privately own the resources needed to produce things, also called the means of production, while the workers only own their labor and whatever they are able to buy with the wages made from selling that labor. Socialism's opposition to capitalism is not simply about greed being bad and sharing being good. Socialism is also not just about everyone paying taxes to publicly fund stuff or the government owning everything. It's about how an unequal and oppressive division of labor relies on one class having both economic and political dominance over the other. For example, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon and the richest person on the planet, doesn't take the majority share of Amazon's wealth because he's doing the majority of the work that produces it. It's the thousands of Amazon workers who produce the output, and that generates the profit. No, Bezos takes the majority of the wealth generated by the workers merely because he privately owns the resources the workers use to produce the output. In other words, Bezos owns the means of production as his own private property. His economic power to exploit the workers is enforced through the political power of the right to private property. Socialism isn't solely about the redistribution of wealth, but also the redistribution of political and economic power through common ownership and control of the means of production used to generate economic wealth in the first place. Socialists believe that, through an equal distribution of both economic and political power, we can build a society that collectively meets the needs of all people in a way that is free of exploitation and oppression and that is sustainable for both people and planet alike. So why do we have capitalism? But now you're probably thinking that it sounds like capitalism kind of sucks and we could definitely do better if we move to a socialist system. So why then do we have capitalism? Well, let's talk about some of the history around how capitalism became the dominant system. In the next section, we will discuss feudalism, the rise of the merchant class, imperialism and colonialism, and the industrial revolution. Capitalism evolved out of European feudalism. In feudal society, the noble class, the kings, dukes, and barons, etc., held power over the peasant class because the nobility had the right to own land and the peasants did not. Feudal economies were based on agriculture and farming, so the more land you controlled, the more power you had over the economy on which everyone else relied. Feudalism is a clear example of how political power is intertwined with economic power and how both are expressed through the division of labor that exists within a society. The political power of exclusive land rights is what allowed the nobility to force an unfair division of labor onto the peasant class. The peasant class did all of the work and produced the majority of the economic output, while the nobility wielded all of the political power, but produced nothing aside from resentment and the occasional war. Between the 15th and 18th centuries, the growth of markets in urban areas and cities increased the demand for trade goods and saw the rise of a new merchant class. With the profits generated from the buying and selling of trade goods, the merchant class eventually overtook the landowning nobility as the dominant social and economic power, which is how capitalism eventually replaced feudalism. But contrary to what the free market cheerleaders of capitalism like to claim, the rise of the merchant class and development of capitalism did not abolish the unjust power dynamics of feudalism so much as it rearranged them. Under the new developing capitalist system, the merchants and the business investors, the capitalists, just replaced the nobility as the ruling class and the new division of power. This new system still blatantly oppressed and exploited the working majority. The major difference between these two systems is that, under capitalism, you can potentially, with a little luck and privilege, advance from being in the working class to being in the capitalist class. In other words, you can potentially go from being the exploited to being the exploiter. This is basically the underlying idea behind what we commonly know as the American dream. But no matter what, capitalism will always require a division of labor and power based on exploitation. The rise and development of capitalism was also greatly influenced by imperialism and colonialism. Imperialism is when a nation seeks to expand its reach, its empire, 
through exerting power and influence over other nations, societies, and people. Colonialism is a specific form of imperialism, where an area is actually taken over and occupied. Imperialism and colonialism's relationship to capitalism is that they are both functions meant to produce profit and wealth through the exploitation of other societies and people, which is why they were crucial in the spread and growth of capitalism as the globally dominant system. Starting in the 1400s, European governments and private merchants began investing in the discovery of new trade routes to the markets of East Asia, which led to expeditions across the Atlantic and down the west coast of Africa. When the expeditions unintentionally stumbled upon the Americas, the Europeans immediately saw an opportunity for exploitation and profit through the subjugation of the indigenous population. This would ignite an era of competitive and brutal colonization that would last into the 1900s, as European powers like Britain, Spain, Portugal, France, and the Netherlands, and eventually the United States, would engage in worldwide imperial competition for economic dominance. The Americas, Africa, Asia, and Australia would all eventually be carved up and exploited by Western imperialism and colonialism. Capitalism, driven by profit, will always seek out the lowest investment cost possible to maximize its return. By seizing the labor, the land, and the resources of indigenous societies by force through imperialism and colonialism, pre-industrial capitalism was able to extract massive profits and wealth at the expense of local people. The enormous wealth generated and enjoyed by Western colonization was built on the subjugation and annihilation of entire indigenous societies. The Aztecs of Central America, the Incas of South America, the Tainos of the Caribbean, and the numerous North American native tribes that occupied what would become the United States are examples of Native American societies that were subjected to genocide in the name of European and United States capitalism. The growth and spread of the African slave trade was also a direct result of capitalist colonization as it was fueled by the need for cheap slave labor to work colonized land. A clear example of how central slavery was to colonial capitalism can be seen in the vast economic growth of the British colonies and then the early United States as it went from being a colonial backwater to a global economic power in just a couple hundred years. Huge sectors of the early US economy, primarily cotton and tobacco production, were completely dependent on slave labor. It can't be overstated enough how much the early economic success of the United States was primarily because of African slavery and the theft of native land. We are to this very day still living with the effects of this exploitation of free labor and free land. The present political and economic oppression experienced by black, brown, and indigenous communities, both in the United States and around the world, is directly linked to the exploitive legacy of Western colonialism and imperialism. Understanding the role of the historic exploitation of labor, land, and resources in the development of capitalism is key to understanding capitalism's role in global poverty and why some nations and communities are more wealthy and developed than others. Now we are going to talk about the last major piece in the story of capitalism, the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, which started in England in the late 1700s before spreading throughout Europe into the United States, was a period of rapid technological advancement in manufacturing, transportation, energy production, and communication. The steam engine, the cotton gin, the telegraph, the electric motor, and the light bulb were all inventions that fueled the Industrial Revolution. These technologies allowed for rates of productivity never before seen in human history, which in turn created generous profits for capitalists who invested in their development and use. Economic industrialization would create a huge demand for a centralized labor force in factories, coal mines, and transportation centers, which would ignite a broad societal shift away from rural agricultural production toward urban industrial production. The resulting massive concentration in urban areas and cities of workers seeking industrial jobs is what would effectively create the modern working class. It was the massive economic growth and centralized profit generated by the Industrial Revolution that would cement capitalism as a dominant socioeconomic system.
During this early industrial period, workers effectively had no rights or power. Scores of men, women, and children were forced to take whatever work they could in order to survive in this new, industrializing world. Unregulated and unchecked, capitalists consolidated huge fortunes on the backs of these workers, whom they exploited for little pay and under unsafe and harsh working conditions that cost many workers their lives. The extreme exploitation and suffering experienced by the new industrial working class under capitalists in their quest for ever higher profits is what would ignite a political and social movement for a better and more just world beyond the inequality and oppression of capitalism. Yes, we're talking about socialism. So now that we've covered the development of capitalism, let's review again in more detail the core principles of socialism. Economically, socialism means democratic worker control over a collective economy and the means of production. Politically, socialism means a system of radical democracy that grants all people equal political power and agency in all matters that affect them. Socially, socialism means a society structured around inherent human equality and dignity, which promotes and supports the free development of all people. But you can't talk about socialism without talking a little about Karl Marx, the most well-known and influential socialist in history. Marx was a 19th century German philosopher, economist, and revolutionary who rose to prominence in the socialist movement by developing the first scientific critique of the capitalist system, along with a revolutionary political theory for a transition from capitalism to socialism. While he is synonymous with socialism and communism, he did not invent either of these though he is considered the father of modern socialism because of the enormous and widespread influence of his work and ideas. Some of the most notable of these ideas are... Exploitation. Marx illustrated how profits are produced from exploitation by the capitalist paying a worker less than the value of what they produce. Put simply, the owner makes a dollar while you make a dime, even though you're the one doing the work that produces what is being sold or exchanged. The portion of value produced by your labor that the owner keeps for themselves after paying your wages is where profit comes from. Without exploitation, there can be no profit. Alienation. Marx's ideas and theories emphasized how selling your labor for an exploitive wage to survive is an unnatural human condition, which alienates you from your work by robbing you of your agency and reducing you to a dehumanized profit-generating tool. I mean, spending so much of our lives doing unfulfilling work is pretty weird when you think about it, right? How many people feel alienated at their jobs but enjoy working when it produces something meaningful or useful to you? That contrast is the alienation Marx is referring to. Systemic Crisis Marx described how since capitalist production is driven by creating profit rather than by need or utility, it requires constant growth and expansion to function and maintain itself which makes it both unstable and unsustainable as it will always cycle through periods of crisis as profit growth eventually hits a wall and the system is forced to expand to survive. Class struggle. Marx outlined how workers and capitalists will always be materially opposed to each other because capitalism requires the exploitation of the working class in order to operate and maintain itself. So the only choice the working class will ever have for liberation is to unite against the capitalists and take power for themselves through a revolutionary restructuring of society. The ideas and theories of Karl Marx and his contemporaries are a deep and significant part of the rich tradition of modern socialist thought and history, but dissecting and diving into these ideas and details are not the focus of this presentation. Socialism and the United States while socialism and socialist struggle is a story that spans across multiple continents, cultures, and generations, this presentation is specifically focused on the socialist movement of the United States. Some of the things we are going to discuss in this next section are the labor movement, socialist political parties, the New Deal era, the repression and purging of socialism in the United States, and U.S. socialism today. The spreading of socialism in the United States began in the latter 1800s with the rise of the labor movement, when workers began organizing for better working conditions and higher wages. 
workers organized industrial and trade unions that challenged the power of the Gilded Age capitalists, who controlled the government and the economy. With effectively no rights or legal protections and inspired by socialist ideas of class struggle and solidarity, organized workers struggled and achieved many victories, including better pay, working conditions, and restrictions on practices like child labor. While most people know about the labor movement as an important part of American history, many are unaware that its most militant members consisted of devoted socialists, communists, and anarchists, and how they faced violent oppression from the state and the business class in their relentless struggle for workers' rights. The first U.S. Socialist parties started forming in the 1870s. By the early 1900s, the most prominent was the Socialist Party of America, which had over 118,000 rank-and-file members at its peak in 1912. Fun fact, DSA was actually formed out of groups that descended from the SPI. The head of the Socialist Party, and America's most prominent socialist figure, was Eugene V. Debs. Debs was a militant labor organizer who helped found both the American Railway Union and the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW. Debs ran for president a total of five times on the Socialist Party ticket, winning 6% of the vote in the 1912 election. A devout socialist, Debs was a notoriously electrifying and inspiring public speaker who ran on a staunch working class platform of radical democracy, a collective economy, and social equality. Some of his political demands included collective ownership and control of industry and its democratic management in the interest of all people, and the elimination of rent, interest, and profit, and the production of wealth to satisfy the wants of all the people. Debs's final run for president was in 1920 from the inside of a prison cell, where he was serving time for violating the Espionage Act of 1917 by speaking out against U.S. involvement in World War I, which he viewed as an unjust war fought by the working class on behalf of imperialism and the rich. Though he may be unknown by many because of socialism's cultural taboo, Debs is one of America's most powerful political figures and holds a highly notable place in our country's political history. Though you wouldn't know it today, socialism used to be a viable and legitimate mainstream political force in the United States, and one that enjoyed support among a substantial portion of the working class. In 1912, when the Socialist Party of America was at the height of its popularity, there were 13 daily socialist newspapers, 12 monthly socialist papers, and 298 weekly publications. Between 1898 and 1933, there were 57 socialist mayors and 23 states. In 1911 alone, 74 cities and towns elected socialist mayors or public officials. Though it is often hidden from us through a revised telling of history, the struggle for socialism is a crucial part of the U.S. story. The Empire Strikes Back, The Purging of U.S. Socialism In 1917, the Russian Socialist Bolshevik Party, led by Vladimir Lenin, took power and declared Russia a socialist workers' state. The Russian Revolution was a historical milestone in that it was the first workers' revolution to successfully take power in a modern nation. This development was a huge inspiration to the socialist movement in the United States. It also terrified Western powers that the same type of revolution could occur in their own countries. It was this fear that would make the Soviet Union the primary scapegoat and pretext for almost all anti-socialist propaganda in the United States for decades. The 1917 Espionage Act that was used to imprison Eugene Debs was also used by the government to repress organized labor during World War I and then throughout the 1920s to harass, monitor, and jail socialists and radical organizers who spoke out against the U.S. government and the capitalist system. In 1919 and 1920, Attorney General Alexander Palmer and a young Herbert Hoover organized a series of federal raids, known as the Palmer Raids, that jailed and deported thousands of socialists. The socialist movement suffered substantially in the 1920s due to the uptick in government repression. The labor movement also suffered a drastic decline as the government started to use anti-labor propaganda to demonize militant unions as being under the influence of foreign Russian forces plotting against the United States. In 
Nationalist messaging was used to reinforce ideas that labor tactics like strikes and walkouts were un-American and treasonous. In 1929, the U.S. stock market crashed, putting capitalism's structural instability on full display and igniting the worst worldwide economic crisis in history, the Great Depression. International trade plunged by more than 50 percent, and unemployment in the United States rose to 25 percent. The massive and widespread economic instability and social unrest caused by the Depression would lay the groundwork for pivotal political movements in both the United States and Europe over the next two decades. Disillusioned with capitalism because of its role in the Depression, the 1930s saw many working-class Americans embracing socialism and specifically the militant politics of the Communist Party. The American Communist Party saw its membership swell to over 65,000 rank-and-file members over the course of the 1930s. While the American Communist Party attracted new members in the 30s because of its militant devotion to labor organizing, many were also inspired by communism's commitment to anti-racism, gender equality, anti-imperialism, and mutual aid for the homeless and the unemployed. The 1930s saw a massive and historic resurgence of the labor movement, re-energized by the economic instability of the Depression and the militancy of socialists, anarchists, and communists on the radical left. Millions of workers formed or joined hundreds of different trade and industrial unions, which organized thousands of strikes, sit-ins, and workplace takeovers. During this period, organized labor grew to become one of the nation's most powerful political forces, strong enough to enact concessions from mainstream politicians and corporations. In 1934 specifically, there were several massive strikes in the cities of Toledo, Ohio, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, as well as the West Coast Waterfront Strike by the Longshoremen's Union, which spread across every major city on the West Coast and led to the San Francisco General Strike, which shut down all work in that city for four whole days. Through solidarity and struggle, socialist organizers and labor unions forced the ruling class to take their working class demands seriously. The rising militancy of the labor movement and the growing political influence of socialism began to greatly worry the wealthy U.S. upper class. They found themselves in a position of having to make concessions in the form of progressive economic reforms, or else they feared, potentially face a repeat of the Russian Revolution within their own borders. The solution they arrived at was the New Deal, a massive slate of progressive laws, reforms, and economic programs passed by the Roosevelt administration that were an attempt to mitigate the massive social and economic unrest caused by the Depression. Roosevelt himself was actually a political moderate and fiscal conservative, as well as a documented racist and anti-Semite, but was pressured into support for New Deal policies because of influence from organized labor and the socialist left. The capitalist class despised the economic and social reforms of the New Deal seeing it as a sign that socialism was a serious and growing threat to their power that had to be dealt with. The New Deal would ultimately serve as an example of how capitalism will always militantly oppose any check on the power to pursue profits unrestricted, as both Republicans and Democrats would work tirelessly to systematically dismantle New Deal reforms over the following years and decades. While the New Deal essentially derailed the movement for more revolutionary change and ultimately illustrated the ineffectiveness of reforms to control and direct capitalism to meet society's needs over pursuing profit, it did illustrate the powerful potential of socialist organizing and ideas to influence politics and challenge capital, and it did provide the working class with some clear progressive wins. It created public works, civil conservation, and federal jobs programs, federal protections for workers to form unions, it established labor regulations, such as the eight-hour workday, overtime pay, and a federal minimum wage. And it established federal welfare services like Social Security and unemployment compensation. It also should be noted that New Deal reforms mostly only applied to white workers, as Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous workers were systematically excluded from most New Deal programs. Nineteen thirty nine saw the start of World War Two, which would have massive implications for the socialist movement in the United States. The US entrance into the war effectively ended the era of New Deal political reforms 
and shifted the focus of the U.S. economy and labor relations toward the war effort. Agreeing to a united home front strategy, many communist leaders in large labor unions were co-opted by the political establishment into backing reactionary policies like federal strike bans for the sake of wartime unity. This would alienate them from their more militant base and signal the start of socialism's weakening influence over organized labor. Worker complacency, with its success of New Deal achievements combined with the economic boost of wartime manufacturing, would undermine socialist organizing momentum and popular support for more radical change. All of these factors, combined with the anti-socialist fundamentalism of the coming Cold War era, would contribute to the purging of socialism's political and economic influence in the United States. In 1945, World War II ended, and many of the developed nations who took part in it were in economic and physical ruin. This left the two primary allied victors, the capitalist United States and the communist Soviet Union, as the world's remaining economic and military superpowers. The Cold War was a military, economic, and ideological proxy war waged by the U.S. against the Soviet Union and socialism, and it was enforced through rampant anti-socialist state propaganda. By framing the Soviet Union as the authoritarian socialist villain, which had to be defeated by the hero of U.S. democratic capitalism, the U.S. government was successful in building popular support for the purging of all forms of socialism from U.S. politics and culture. In the late 1940s and 50s, unconstitutional legislation, such as the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 and the Communist Control Act of 1954, effectively purged socialists from the mainstream U.S. politics and organized labor leadership. Socialism became a dirty word, synonymous with anti-American authoritarianism. Communist revolutions and socialist struggles that would occur over the following decades in places like China, Cuba, South America, Korea, and Vietnam were all framed as Soviet attempts to take over the world and used to justify drastic and violent U.S. economic and military intervention. At home, repression was enforced through state-backed tactics such as the Second Red Scare of McCarthyism in the 1950s and the illegal FBI COINTELPRO operation that was used throughout the 60s and 70s to harass and murder political radicals and to disrupt social justice movements associated with socialist ideas and anti-capitalist politics. Absent an organized and militant socialist influence, the strength of organized labor in the United States and its check on worker exploitation began declining substantially starting in the 1960s. New Deal policies were slowly dismantled by both Republican and Democratic-controlled governments over the next several decades in favor of neoliberal economics, which basically means economic policies that favored massive market deregulation and the privatization of public services and programs. Income inequality really began to skyrocket in the late 1970s, with a heavy political opposition to organized labor by the major political parties, the exporting of large numbers of manufacturing jobs to cheap labor markets overseas, and a huge increase in the use of automation, which allowed for increased productivity without having to hire more workers or increase wages. All this allowed for an ever-increasing portion of the economic wealth produced by working class productivity, which constantly kept increasing, to be consolidated by a small percentage of capitalists at the very top. Between 1978 and 2015, Average CEO pay rose by over 997%, while actual worker pay has barely increased at all. Despite being politically and socially ostracized, socialism and socialist ideas would endure and have major influence on the cultural liberation movements of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, such as the anti-war movement, Many of the most active organizations in the anti-war movement of the 1960s, including the Students for a Democratic Society, were inspired by socialist ideas such as anti-imperialism, participatory democracy, and economic equality. Civil Rights and the Black and Brown Power Movements Many are unaware that Martin Luther King Jr. was a radical anti-capitalist and advocated for democratic socialism. And at the time of his assassination, 
he had been increasingly highlighting the intersectionality of economic and racial oppression. Many other prominent members of the civil rights and black power movements, such as Angela Davis and Bayard Rustin, were open socialists and communists. The Black Panther Party, the most well-recognized embodiment of the black power movement, was formed and led by revolutionary socialists, and their program was heavily centered on anti-capitalist class struggle. Socialist ideas like self-determination, anti-imperialism, and class struggle were also core features of the organizations of the Brown Power Movement, such as the Young Lords. The Women's Liberation Movement Socialist feminist ideas around the intersection of gender and class and the relationship between patriarchy and capitalism were central to many of the organizations that powered the women's liberation movement. The LGBTQ liberation movement. Formed after the 1969 Stonewall riots, the Gay Liberation Front was one of the most militant early organizations of the LGBTQ liberation movement. They were also explicitly anti-capitalist, supporters of the Black Panther Party, and promoted many of the intersectional ideas of socialist feminism. The late 1990s and 2000s saw a resurgence of American political movements based in class struggle, such as the 1999 Seattle World Trade Organization protests and the 2011 Occupy Wall Street protests. Over a decade removed from the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, the political climate in the United States showed signs of a major shift in popular opinion of socialism and laid the groundwork for its resurgence in U.S. politics and culture. In 2016, Bernie Sanders ran for president on an explicitly working-class platform of universal health care, public-funded education, and economic justice. He also openly identified himself as a democratic socialist the first major mainstream politician to identify as a socialist in over a generation. This single-handedly exposed and normalized socialism and its ideas to an entire U.S. generation, hungry for radical change and a bold vision to combat rising economic inequality and social oppression. Now socialism is officially back its legitimate force in mainstream politics and culture, with many candidates running for office openly identifying as socialists and socialist organizations like DSA seeing huge surges in our membership from just over 5,000 in 2016 to over 55,000 today. Socialism. So how do we do it? The problems that socialism aims to address are not small aspects of an otherwise healthy system. Capitalism isn't broken, but rather has and always will work the way that it currently does. It has shown time and time again its inability to be either equitable or sustainable, and we have to think big and set our sights high if we want to make something better a reality. Advocating for a better world through socialism means advocating for deep and fundamental changes to how our government, economy, and society operate. This naturally won't be easy or swift and will require a long and hard struggle that must be fought by a large majority of people. There's one word that's used a lot in socialist politics, probably more than any other after capitalism, which describes the size and degree of change that we need to be fighting for. That word is... Revolution. Now the word revolution tends to send some people into a frenzy of uneasiness because it instantly evokes images of massive turmoil, the overthrowing of governments, violent militias, and maybe even war. For many, this word is so scary because it represents the total upheaval of everything they know and love. While revolutions can most certainly be extremely militant and violent affairs, and there are definitely socialists whose politics are in this camp, the most useful and accurate meaning of revolution for us is simply that it means a big fundamental change to how our society is structured and operates. To be a revolutionary or have revolutionary ideas really just means believing that the massive changes necessary to achieve a better world through socialism are both possible and necessary. Being completely certain as to exactly how it will happen or what it will look like isn't as important as actually believing that it can and should be done in the first place. A socialist future that moves humanity beyond the oppression and exploitation of capitalism will require big and bold changes to be achieved. It will require some form of revolution 
but what that revolution actually looks like is something we will have to determine for ourselves. There is no silver bullet or one clear path to achieving a socialist victory, but one thing is for sure, and that is that building a powerful revolutionary movement requires organizing and engagement on a variety of fronts. Electoral politics. How much emphasis should be placed on electoralism is a contentious topic among many socialists, but the general consensus is that it is an arena of struggle that must be engaged in. Electing socialists to public office, answerable to a united working class base, can give the movement a powerful voice to directly influence policies that help us build power outside of electoralism. We must use the bully pulpit of political office to demand transformative reforms, large-scale changes that meaningfully shift power and resources away from the ruling class and toward the working class. Pushing for these types of reforms can both promote class consciousness and materially improve people's lives, so they are better able to organize and support themselves in the larger struggle. Universal health care, guaranteed housing and jobs, and free education are all examples of transformative reforms that can inspire more radical demands. We can't legislate a transition to socialism, as the ruling class will never allow that to happen. But we must have our hands on the wheels of state power and government institutions if we want to give the movement a necessary and crucial advantage it will need to win in the long term. Union organizing. Labor, when militant and organized, always has the most direct and powerful impact on the capitalist system as capitalism requires labor to function. The power to stop production is the most powerful tool of the working class, as was seen most recently by the role of airport workers in ending the early 2019 government shutdown and by the numerous successful strikes by teachers unions happening across the country over the past year. Tenant unions are another way to achieve the same type of emancipatory power. When tenants come together and act collectively, they're able to fight landlords who would otherwise bulldoze over them if they were acting individually. Organizing people to be united in their workplaces and in their housing communities builds power for the entire movement by bringing together people from different demographics and backgrounds and highlighting their common struggle and the power to achieve tangible victories through directly challenging their oppressors collectively. Direct action and protest. Challenging power has to be done on our terms and not on those of the ruling class. Mobilizing en masse and using our numbers and militancy to influence and subvert forms of oppression is key to making serious demands and influencing change through direct pressure on employers, landlords, public officials, and government institutions. Strikes, walkouts, takeovers, protests, occupations, and boycotts are all effective ways to fight oppression when there is an organized mass driving them. Direct actions that achieve their goals are also empowering and will inspire more people to join the movement. Our greatest material power will always be our numbers, and we should exercise that power whenever possible. Mutual aid and community building. Any movement must be built on solidarity in order to be sustainable. We must develop and support ourselves with our own systems of mutual aid and community that can be maintained outside of capitalist and state institutions. The ruling class will never supply us with the necessary resources that we need to survive and thrive, especially if we are organizing against them. This part of our organizing is absolutely crucial to building a common trust that is strong enough to withstand the trials and tribulations of both inevitable economic crisis and the impending ecological catastrophe of climate change, as well as the barrage of repressive forces that will be unleashed on us with increasing intensity as the movement grows and becomes more militant. We must always remember that in the end, all we have is each other, and that an injury to one is an injury to all. The fight for revolutionary change will not be an easy one, and there are numerous and formidable obstacles in our path. We need to be clear about what we are up against and be sober about what it will take to win. Let's talk about what some of these obstacles are. The rich, white supremacy, patriarchy, nationalism, the state, and fascism. The rich. The entrenched power of the rich is by far our biggest and most powerful obstacle. 
the billions of dollars that make up the massive wealth of the ruling class is material power that gives them huge amounts of control over the economy and the political system. And as long as they have the power of their money, the working class will never achieve its emancipation. By 2013, the top 1% are predicted to own two thirds of the world's wealth. If we don't manage to organize a movement large enough to challenge them and to redistribute that wealth, we don't stand a chance of saving both our society and our planet from economic and ecological catastrophe. White supremacy is the status quo in our society as it is the social, economic, and political dominance of white people upheld through the historic oppression and marginalization of people of color. Patriarchy is a much older but equally powerful oppressive system in our society, being it is its social, economic, and political dominance of heterosexual male masculinity upheld through the oppression of women and LGBTQ people. These two types of oppression aren't just based around individual attitudes and beliefs, but rather are both systems deeply entrenched in our society through our history, our culture, and our political and economic institutions. Your status in relation to the narrow spectrum of white male heterosexuality determines your access to employment, education, housing, healthcare, and physical safety. Socialism can never be achieved without the abolition of white supremacy and patriarchy, as they both serve to uphold and enforce capitalist hierarchies by dividing us, the diverse multitudes that make up the working class, along socially constructed lines of race, gender, and sexuality. Nationalism, as it exists in the United States, is the mythology of American exceptionalism, which promotes the unjust and violent oppression of cultures and people deemed illegitimate or inferior to the false national ideal that is forced upon us by the U.S. ruling class. Nationalism requires we identify ourselves not as fellow members of a globally oppressed class in a common struggle for liberation and equality, but instead by an allegiance to an insincere national identity that instructs us to ignore the violent and brutal imperialism of both our history and our present. Socialism is fundamentally an international movement, which means our solidarity must be with all oppressed people everywhere, and not built around the false glorified history and hollow pride of nationalism. The state. When under the control of a capitalist elite, the government becomes a tool to oppress those whom they exploit for profit. The police, the prison system, and the military are all institutions used to oppress and control the working class under the false disguise of maintaining law, order, and justice. The victims of police brutality, mass incarceration, and military violence are and always have been overwhelmingly the marginalized and the poor. Working class organizing in opposition to the status quo, especially as it grows in size and influence, poses a clear threat to entrenched power and will always be met with the full force of disruption, infiltration, surveillance, and repression by state power. We must be ever mindful of the threat these forces are to our organizing and be diligent in highlighting, fighting, and dismantling them by publicly exposing their injustices, neutralizing them politically, and directly subverting them when possible through direct action. Fascism is a violent mix of racism and hypernationalism, and it's the ultimate form of right-wing authoritarianism. Fully developed, it is the complete social and political uniting of one group against another based on social identifiers like race, religion, and ethnicity. The crimes and atrocities of the German Nazi party during World War II were a clear and well-known example of the brutality of fully realized state fascism. Fascism is currently on the rise, both in the United States and Europe, because it feeds off the instability of capitalism and the economic havoc it wreaks on the working class. As social and economic conditions become unbearable in the face of capitalism's failure to provide for people's material needs, working class communities and people become susceptible to the radically violent beliefs and explanations that fascism offers in order to make sense of their suffering. Fascism grows by stepping into the void created by the economic anxiety of capitalism. It creates a clear enemy by blaming marginalized groups like immigrants, Jews, people of color, and LGBTQ people for others' struggles and suffering rather than calling out the underlying system itself. Fascism is the violent final option for a declining capitalist system, struggling to hold on to power. It is only through building a movement for socialism that we can effectively fight this rising fascism by providing working people an alternative 
that presents a clear path to justice, liberation, and prosperity for all of us. The inevitable worldwide economic and ecological catastrophe, which has been developing all around us for decades, is now at our doorstep and demands that we take action now. We can and we must win a better world. A just and prosperous future built on the democratic values and collective principles of socialism. There's so much work to do, and everyone has a part to play in growing and building this movement, no matter how small a routine you may think your contribution might be. Because our power, our real power, will always be in our numbers. We are the many and the capitalists are the few. If we succeed in coming together and organize around our common struggles, we will grow large enough and strong enough to challenge their power and win our liberation. Bound by solidarity, there is nothing the people working together in a common struggle cannot accomplish. We are in a time of both danger and hope. We have a historic opportunity to help build a mass movement of the working class, to build a just and socialist future for all. A better world is possible. 